so uh, yeah, I, after a couple of days, I did uh, offer to Wolf, like, if anyone drops out, I've, I've got to talk because people are like, are you doing a talk, Dave? And it's like, well, no, actually. So if anyone said that, it's your fault I'm doing this now. Um, so if you were at GAC, Mac, you'll have seen a very similar version to this. And if you are going to SEG, you'll see a longer version uh, of this. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, unconventional magmatic sulfide systems. Um, so lots of people are thank for that, particularly uh, Daryl and Marco being part of this. Uh, for a long time. Um, so let's define what I mean by conventional first. Um, so this sort of spatial distribution and, and correlation between craton margins and major nickel deposits we've known uh, for quite some time. Uh, even things like the yield garden, where you're like, oh, wait, wait a minute, we've got nickel deposits down the middle of a craton there, it's a paleocraton uh, boundary. So um, that's been known for a while. So this is what I'm saying is a sort of a, a, a classic conventional style. Um, so we've got superior cratons, a great one. So we've got, you know, some periods there. We've got Camartiites at uh, Raglan, Thompson, a little bit of time there before Voise's Bay pops up there on the edge of the North Atlantic craton. Uh, then we've got major sort of plume related uh, activity in the mid continent rift uh, down here. Um, and the sort of, background for that, the, the way that this has been uh, explained is this sort of classic model uh, on the left, originally put forward by Graham Begg and co-authors in their paper in 2010. Steve Barnes redrew it with, uh, with a bit more colour um, in 2016 in his paper on the mineral system approach to nickel sulphide uh, deposits. So if you look at that paper and think this is the mineral system for, for nickel sulphides, this is the, the classic approach. Uh, and it's all to do with plume impingement during uh, uh, continent breakup uh, and the plume head gets channeled towards thinner uh, parts of the crust where you get plenty of melting uh, it's very hot, melts that and then you've got the nice translithospheric uh, fault systems through which these magmas can uh, ascend interact with crustal rocks and form nickel deposits um, so you've got crack on margins, thin lithosphere fault systems and plumes and that is fine for some deposits, okay? There are some classic deposits that we think form uh, in that way. But what it means is if you take this into a sort of an exploration approach, um, you are sort of looking for craton margins for nickel deposits. Uh, the PGE deposits seem to be intracratonic, but along these major um, sort of transcrustal uh, uh, fault zones anyway. Um, but there is a bit of an emphasis there on the need for plumes to have enough heat to melt a largely pyriditic um, source there. So um, we're looking for plume times when we've got plumes uh, and around craton margins. But sticking up a, a, um, a map of uh, all the magmatic sulfide deposits, or not quite all of them, but you know this is a 2010 paper, uh, not all of them are uh, uh, plume related. And uh, not all of them are on craton margins, and some of the ones that are on craton margins may not be plume related. In fact, quite a lot of them are actually orogenic. And um, we heard quite a bit in the last couple of days, so I'm actually going to pick up on that. Um, uh, and some of the, those orogenic ones might actually now be on craton margins. So uh, looking at you, Nova Bollinger, uh, for that one. Um, so some of the ones that were mentioned um, uh, in the last couple of days, the ones in the Central Asian orogenic belt, parts of some of the Finnish nickel belts, Aqua Blanca, and others uh, are these more sort of collisional belt systems. So what's the main difference here in that mineral system? And it's like, well, in collisional systems, we tend to have probably a period or some periods of subduction um, related to it. And what that does is, we're fairly, fairly familiar with this, if you've ever uh, looked at a porphyry uh, paper or deposit or been to a lecture on porphyries, slab devolatilization, fertilization, and, and that mantle wedge becomes pretty hydrous. You can also add things like tellurium, maybe some metals, certainly volatiles, carbon perhaps, um, and sulfur. And so what that does is it sort of fundamentally changes your mantle source, which is the first part of the mineral system uh, in terms of um, forming a nickel deposit. So that gives us the question, so that it, you know, step one in forming a nickel or a PGE sulfide deposit is melting some mantle. So it's actually, well, what are we melting? 
generally speaking, we think that we mail like the models and, and some of Tony Noldritz ones with the classic sort of, uh, you know, this much melting. And this is where this is what happens to nickel. Um, because nickel is in olivine, you've got to melt lots of olivine to get all the nickel out to, to produce that. Now, that's fine in some cases where we've got a peridotite, which is the stuff on the left there, and we've got nickel deportment down the bottom there, and basically all the all, the nickel there is in the olivine. These are mineral maps done at um, Leicester, um, or maybe a little bit in orthopyroxene. But if we're actually looking at much more hydrous, metasomatized uh, mantle, it's much more exotic in terms of its mineralogy. Um, so it contains things like more CPX, maybe some amphibole, and the orange stuff in here, uh, is phlogopite. Now, interesting thing about phlogopite in these mantle rocks is it can contain a lot of nickel, almost as much nickel as olivine. But the interesting thing about the phlogopite is that it can melt at about 300 degrees Celsius lower than you would melt olivine. So you can potentially form a very nickel fertile melt by melting something and maybe you don't need a really big heat driver. And um, so I'm going to give a plug for uh, the project which you're working on uh, uh, on this. Um, so this is our uh, CMET 4D project, which is funded by BHP. So some people in the audience who have been involved with this. Um, sorry, your name was on there, Libby, but you moved on from it. But she was, <laughs> Libby was involved with this. Um, so that's uh, us at Leicester and UWA Macquarie, and, and we're, we're picking up on some of these themes. Um, and so on that, um, if we look at this sort of the, the, the Venn diagram of, of the mineral system, early fertility is one of the key, key parts of, 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 of the mineral system here. Um, and the source is therefore a first order control on two things, um, on, well, on the fertility of it, by the degree of melting, so how much melting you have, little bit might not be so fertile, lots of it might well be fertile, but also the composition. So a little bit of melting of a peridotite might not be very nickel um, fertile, little bit of melting of a, of a hydrous um, source might be. So let's go to an end member of that. Let's have a look at the products of uh, melting of some really low degree, but uh metasomatized sources and uh the place to look at these are in the sort of the the post-collisional alkaline magmatic uh system so we did a bit of work um a few years ago on on this looking at some samples from this for from La maria did a beautiful job of uh, uh bringing one of my diagrams to life earlier on um so these, I would say, are a little bit unconventional because they're formed in sort of post-collisional alkaline settings, which we don't usually uh, see as being particularly prospective. And to be honest, these are relatively small occurrences anyway, but they're occurrences. They have some PGE in them, uh, but they're definitely in, in, in collisional belts, these. Um, so here's a few examples uh, of those that we worked on. Um, and one of the key things is that they're not necessarily hosted by ultramafic rocks. These can be more mafic and they're particularly uh, hydrous as well. So you've got things like um, lots of phlogopite, uh, maybe some apatite in there, um, uh, uh, amphiboles as well. Uh, this is a bit of an extreme example of one of these. This is from the... Uh, the Mordor complex in Northern Territory in Australia and any Lord of the Rings fans out there are going, oh, is that anything to do with Lord of the Rings, that Mordor? Well, this is the Mordor alkaline igneous complex and it is bounded by this sort of box, uh, almost implausibly right angled sort of uh, ridge of, of, of sedimentary rocks, um, which if you go to Tolkien's... Uh, diagram in his 1960-odd uh, Lord of the Rings book, that, that's that, that's pretty close. So that's where it's from. So um, uh, we visited this just before the pandemic and uh, wrote a paper up over, over lockdown on this, but uh, managed to get a reference, a citation to Tolkien in a scientific paper. So it's, it's in my reference library. Um, so, and uh, those rocks at the top, by the way, are, are referred to as Shonkinites, which is a terrific name. So sort of mafic cyanites. Uh, other things, uh, themes with these sorts of rocks is that there's lots of carbonate in there. Uh, we can go into the bubble debate, but we we, we think that we've got CO2 uh, bubbles or what we did have in, in some of these. And we've got the little 
calcite uh, unicorn there from from Scotland. So these are carbonated, they're hydrous, relatively low volume, but they also, the metal flavor is different. They tend to be a bit more copper, tellurium, gold rich. A little bit of platinum palladium in these and virtually no IPGs. Okay, so there's, there's a distinct metallogenic DNA. And so we started looking at a few, a couple of um, uh, potentially similar ones. So. These ones I'm not particularly uh, sure about, whether these are actually alkaline, but they, the Yoquip district in South Africa and the images here are from the Curaçao district in, in Brazil. Uh, so this is uh, Eero Copper uh, we're working with then. These are very copper rich, but very, very hydrous, loads of phlogopite in there, um, lots of tellurium and gold as well. Um, so very volatile rich, but the, the interesting thing about these is they're intruded into the lower crust. And in the district, there's a load of intrusions which have got copper sulfides in them, but then there's also some intrusions which have got nickel sulfides in without the copper. So uh, there's potentially something happening there and a fractionation at a very large scale. But something Rebecca mentioned um, uh, yesterday morning was trying to treat things in the lower crust differently because they stay hotter for longer. Okay, potentially very, very long time. So the things that are temperature dependent, the time scales, for example, fractionation of sulfide liquid may be happening a little bit uh, uh, more so than we think, maybe on a district scale, perhaps working on that. Uh, something that is probably really unconventional, and this is my, I'm not going into the hydrothermal stuff at like at Enterprise. Uh, so the Jaguar deposit, which is in um, the uh, uh, Carajas region in, in Brazil. Um, so lots of uh, classic IOCGs here, real sort of lower crustal, like deep IOCG systems. Uh, but some of them have got some nickel in. Whether Jaguar is actually an IOCG or whether it's a, a deep... Um, a remobilized sulfide deposit. I think the, the jury's out on that one, um, but maybe we can see some talks on that um, at the next nickel symposium. But uh, zooming in on that, interestingly, so the 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 nickel sulfides, which uh, I suppose in the previous photo they don't look too dissimilar to to what we might expect, and maybe a bit more pyrite, there's some apatite in there. Um, but they're hosted by sort of shear zones. This is massive nickel sulfide in shear zones. So they've clearly been remobilized along shear zones. Interestingly, though, the, the one and the two here are ultramafic rocks. Uh, and the 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 these parts here are false. So whether this is just a quite a case like maybe the Curaçao region that you've got deep crust, you've got to look at it differently. Think about things moving much further than you might expect over longer time scales and being really structurally uh, controlled. So uh, in deep crustal environments, I think, um, yeah, we need to have a look at these things a little bit differently. Upper crustal environments though, let's have a look at some collision, proper collisional belt deposits. And there's quite a few of these. Uh, the Chinese ones are a pretty good example. So we've got three main periods of magmatic sulfides, classic continent breakup, Jin Shuan, okay? 860, things break up. Uh, and then late Permian, Emma Shan Lip, classic plume. We've got things like Jin Bao Shan and those uh, deposits down here. But in this sort of Devonian to Triassic period, um, we've got the Central Asian orogenic belt, so that we had uh, talks yesterday on those, and also one that was mentioned this morning, Jayarahamu. So this is a bit older. This is 410. It's big. It's 150 odd million tons uh, of nickel. It's got a high nickel to copper ratio. Interestingly, though, very low PGE in these collisional uh, belt settings. So they have these trough-shaped uh, PGE profiles. Widely accepted that the source of this is actually subduction metasomatized uh, lithospheric mantle. Okay, so this is no plume uh, evidence here. I, I got that quote from the, the talk this morning. No evidence for a plume here, uh, but that is a major nickel deposit. Um, and the other ones in that Central Asian orogenic belt have PG profiles that look like that as well. It seems to be a very characteristic feature of collisional belt um deposits and there's quite a few of these sort of collisional ones around so this one uh just moving to tanzania here this is in taka hill 
Um, so this is not the same age in Belt as Cabanga, which is, which is much older. Um, so this is in Tacker Hill, which is down here. Uh, again, we've got a high nickel to copper ratio, very low PGE again, but this is in place during a period of island arc magnetism. This is not generally what we traditionally thought of as being uh, uh, traditional magmatic sulfide stuff. And then we've even got some here in the UK. So uh, in Scotland, um, so in the caledonide, so again, this is this is orogenic stuff. It, it, these are timed uh, right at sort of peak collisional, about 470 million years uh, up near Aberdeen. Aberdeen's uh, very about here. Um, so we've got a, a belt of caledonide um, uh, magmatism with mafic, ultramafic units. And uh, these are images from the, the cores that have been pulled out of there this summer. So uh, uh, Aberdeen minerals and peak minerals. So I don't know whether Chris McKenzie's still here. We've got a couple of companies up there uh, working on these. And these are these are collisional belt stuff. And they sort of probably go up towards uh, into Norway as well with Rana. So these are... Um, effectively not actually unconventional um but it's a different way of thinking about how you form a magmatic sulfide system in a collisional belt it's like it's not just a porphyry if you've got maybe the lower crustal expressions of those collisional belts or those collisional belts have whacked themselves onto a craton margin at some point um they may well find uh, a nickel but the key thing here in terms of um, and bringing it back to to some um parts of the project that we were working on the, that source control at the beginning, if you have a hydrous, uh, maybe carbonated, metasomatized mantle source, it's going to melt at lower temperatures than a peridotite. So you don't need the big heat driver. So the general thought is you need something fertile, you need the structures, and you need a heat driver. You don't necessarily need a plume. So a bit of extension might work. So collision or a little bit of sort of post-collisional extension, like I think we had in one of the Chinese orogenic belt ones yesterday. Um, and they're sort of favorable uh, maybe for nickel sulfides and maybe this or those deeper, deeper sections is where we're going to make the next big discovery. So um, the alkaline systems, we quite like them because they showed us uh, some of the processes quite nicely, particularly with the carbonate, you know, that different flavor with the copper gold tellurium. Um, whether they're big enough to form a, a something decent, don't know. Uh, Kurosara Keep may be along those lines, but I think they may be a subclass in their own in those deep, deep crustal um, sections. Uh, Jaguar is probably in there uh, as well. So again, if you're in the lower crust, think about what's going on in terms of processes. You're not going to find a chilled margin, for example, if the host rocks are like 800 degrees in any way. Um, and so collisional belts are either amalgamated to craton margins or on their own, like in parts of Central Asia, uh, are prospective for nickel sulfide deposits. Whether they've got PGE in them or not at a platinum conference, uh, it may, may be something different, but that does seem to be a little bit of a, um, a, a theme with them. So plumes and lips are good, um, but they're not essential if you have the right ingredients to begin with. So, thanks. <laughs> Let's have a question or two for Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. That was a really good talk. One question I have, though, is, um, you know, they're, they're depleted in PGs, but they don't seem like they're ultra depleted in PGs. And so if you're melting a mantle wedge that have been processed already by melt extraction, one might think that they would be even lower than that. But so do you think that PGs are transported by fluids and subduction zones from the slab or? or Well, number of possibilities here for that, but that, that's one of them. Maybe the PGs aren't there in the first place, or maybe they've been extracted by some other means, either earlier magnetism, which has moved it out, maybe fluid activity, but it does seem to be a common theme or maybe you just don't have PG fertility in there. I mean, most of those ones I'm talking about are relatively young as well. So that might be a factor as well, but can't answer that yet, but it's intriguing certainly. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, 
you mentioned the nickel rich flogger bite. I did. Yeah. Does that contain chlorine and fluorine as well? Ooh. Do we know that? I don't know. I shall check that. Okay. So oh. yeah, we're we're talking. Yeah, sort of up to two thousand ppm, typically something like that. So it, it's high, but. What would you expect it to be, chlorine or fluorine, Rich? Mm, chlorine, probably. Yeah. Okay. That would that would be my preferred fluxing agent. Hmm. Basically, the best. And uh, so, uh, my, and 